I am honored to be with you this morning. My name is John Abner. I am a, a City of Mount Dora employee. Um, I am a, a husband to my amazing wife, Kendra, uh, father to my girls, uh, Isabella and Bree. And um, I used to do this about six or seven times a week. And now I do it about six or seven times a year. So I don't take it lightly, the honor that it is to, to be here with you. Um, I, uh, I had a message prepared that uh, I wanted to share when Moses asked if I could be here about three or four weeks ago. And then in light of things that are, are happening in our world, I sat down this week and, and just decided to, to go a different direction. So please bear with me and um, uh, you pray for me, I'll pray for you. And we'll get through this together. Um, so I was raised by a single mom right outside of Cincinnati, Ohio. And my entire life, she had three jobs. Uh, one, to raise me, which was probably the most difficult of all three of those jobs. Um, uh, I, I imagine that raising me was uh, a lot like trying to guard Michael Jordan. Like, at the end of the night, you're like, eh, he didn't score 100. And raising me at the end of the night, I'm sure there was many times when my mom said, eh, he didn't burn the house down. And the reason I know that is because Galatians 6 is very clear that God will not be mocked. We will reap what we sow. And at 35 years old, uh, my wife birthed a mini-me. And at the end of every day, we're like, eh, we still have a house. So... Life is okay. Um, she had a, a main job, which was usually in sales, and then she always worked a, a, another job, which was usually tending bar or serving at a restaurant, specifically on Friday and Saturday nights. And uh, I am thankful uh, for that time that, that she uh, worked in the service industry because at a very young age, I got to watch my mom uh, surround herself with all kinds of people that came from different backgrounds, that didn't look the same way that she looked, and yet they accepted and embraced her as a single mom, and she accepted and embraced them in whatever walk of life they came from. And I had an opportunity long before I understood the unity of Christ, I understood what it looked like to love someone that might look different than us. Now, in regards to the service industry, let me say this. They have been ravaged by what's happening. And so please, I urge you, if you go out to eat, please be patient. Please be loving. And I would say that now is not an okay time to tip 15%. I would say you need to be tipping 20. You need to be tipping 30. You need to be tipping 50. Uh, if you, that only means you go out to eat once a month, it's okay. But take care of these people that have been hurt so much by everything that's going on. But I got a chance to see this. I got a chance to uh, participate in it. And then at a young age, when I, like 21, uh, when I accept Jesus as Savior, 22 years old, uh, I, I begin to learn the roots of all of that. And, and I hope today to um, share with you a little bit of, of the source of unity and, and then uh, hopefully uh, together we can go out into this hurting world and, and make an impact and love those that we come in contact with well. So turn to Ephesians chapter 4 if you would. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. I'm going to read verses 1 through 6, so follow along in your Bibles. I therefore, so Paul writing to the church in Ephesus, calls himself a prisoner for the Lord, and he urges us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness and patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. For grace was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. One God, it says there. That's where the source of unity for all people start. There's one true living God. And the reality is, is that, that we live in a world where people believe in many gods, but at the end of the day, we know that there is only one. 
He made every human being. Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 and 27 makes this very clear. God has created every single human being in his image. And humanity is higher and greater than anything else that God created. Whether it be plants, whether it be animals, regardless of what anybody says to you, regardless of how many PhDs they might have, God says that we were all made in his image. And hear me this morning, every human being has dignity, has value, and has worth. And every person belongs to the human race, and we all have the same roots. Acts chapter 17 verse 26 says that, and he, that's God, made from one man, that's Adam, every nation of mankind. This uh, word nation in the Greek is ethnos. It means ethnic groups. God made from one man every single ethnic group, every single nation. That means that different ethnic groups and different cultures are not a result of a curse. Many theologians have taught this throughout history. Many scholars have articulated this, and many pastors have voiced it. But Acts chapter 17, verse 26 says that the races, the ethnicities, are here by the design of God. And hear me this morning, God doesn't make mistakes. And in the same way that he created all of his creation with diversity and beauty, and glory from the top to the bottom, so he created his highest creation, mankind, with diversity. And so we all come from Adam. We all have the same roots. You want to trace those roots back to your ancestors, ultimately you get to him. So what color or ethnicity was Adam? I don't know. We all have the same roots. Was he dark? Was he light? What about Eve? Let me ask you this question. Was one dark and one light? And let me ask you another question. Does that offend you? Because the reality is is that we don't know. Human beings were created by him, and we were created for purpose. We were created to worship God, to know him, to have relationship with him, to love him, to have affection for him, to praise his name. That's why every human being was made. God himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God is one. The Lord our God is one, and yet he's three. So God is one, unity. God is three, diversity. Even in creator, we see this. Of course, if he is united and diversified, we're going to see that in his creation. He's been in relationship with himself for all eternity. The father has always loved the son. The son has always loved the father. And the Holy Spirit has always loved the father and son. And so hear me this morning, God's design is that we, his creation, his highest level of creation, amidst unity and diversity, worship him. I've said for years that it brings God great glory when people that look the same and come from the same socioeconomic background and have the same type of history worship him, but it brings him the greatest glory when people that come from all different backgrounds stand together and worship the same God. We were created to live in a diverse and loving community with other people. In Genesis chapter 2, God makes Adam, and all of a sudden we realize something's not okay. And that's that Adam is alone. And so he makes a different type of person. A woman. They were different They were distinct, yet the two would become one, diversity and unity from the very beginning of creation. Their descendants would represent all the people groups, all the ethnic groups of the world. And so God has made us to live in relationship with his people, not like us, 
for his glory and by his design. But the reason that we're where we are today in this nation is because we all have a common enemy, Satan. Genesis 3 makes this very clear. Listen, Satan hates God. Satan hates white people. Satan hates black people. Satan hates Asians. Satan hates Indians. If uh, John 3, 16 were written by Satan, it would say, for Satan so hated the world. But that's not it, right? We know what it says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever would believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You see, God has rescued Satan's victims through Jesus. And the song that we sing instead is Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are all precious in his sight. And after that, we should say, come to the king and worship him. None of us are without sin. We've all sinned. We've all lied. We've all hated at some point in our lives. We've all worshiped creation rather than creator. We've all fallen short. But the good news of the gospel is that there is grace and there is forgiveness there is a solution to the dilemma that all of us are in, and that solution is the source of unity for God's people. And that solution is the gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ for me and for you is that God sent his son to die for sinners like me. God sent his son to die for racists, for rebels, for all of us that have fallen short. And he didn't deserve it. Jesus lived the perfect life of holiness and righteousness and justice and love, and he did not deserve to die. But instead, he died in my place. And in your place, in the place of sinners, and when he was crucified, he said these words, it is finished, it's done. And that was enough to make us one. Jesus' finished work on the cross, when he took upon himself the wrath of Father, the fury and the judgment that I deserved, it was enough. As a substitute for me and you, he died and was crushed for our iniquities. He was raised from death, victorious over death and hell and racism and cultural superiority. And he is victorious over all of it. And he loves you. And he's got a plan for you. In the midst of everything that is going on, God has put you in this town, in this moment, for such a time as this. No matter what you've done, the cross is enough for you. Every Christian knows that there is one true God and Father. Verse 6 there in Ephesians chapter 4. One God, one Father, who is over all and through all and in all. He says earlier in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, we, we learn about this about the Father. It says, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. It says, in love he predestined us. I can tell you right now that one of the things that you'll never hear from God is, I didn't see that coming. He knew the mess that Satan is trying to make of this life. He knows the spirit 
that he puts inside of each of you. And he knows what happens when light shines in dark places. He knows the change that you have been predestined to be a part of. He loves you, and you are a part of his perfect plan. Ephesians 1.10, a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things on, uh, in heaven and things on earth. God's eternal plan is to unite all people in Christ, and he loves you deeply in the midst of it. He's father to the fatherless. He loves you deeply. Father calls us personally. Hear me this morning. When God called you, he called you into his family by name. He said to me, he said, John, come to me. He personally loves each and every one of us. And in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, this calling is referenced. Right there at the beginning of this chapter, he says, I therefore, Paul says, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner. What kind of manner, Paul? Worthy of which you have been called. He tells each and every one. He says, I've called you. I've predestined you. I've, I've plucked you out of the hand of the enemy. An attorney that would be bound for, for hell and punishment, is which we deserve. He said, I've plucked you from his grasp, and I've called you to something better. And since I've done this on your behalf, therefore, in this short, laid down life, Walk in a way that is worthy of the calling that I have upon your life. It doesn't mean that the person that stands behind this platform, that means for every single one of us that have said yes to him, he has called us to walk in a, a manner that is worthy of the calling to which you have. In light of the fact that God has loved you and called you, walk worthy of that. Love others. Your life should demonstrate the Father's love. This Father that we serve, sovereign ruler over the universe. Ephesians 1 verse 11 says that I'm in him, in Christ. We've attained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works. Now notice this word. He says who works, not some things. Ephesians 1 verse 11, all things according to the counsel of his will. God is working out all things according to the counsel of his will. There's not some maverick molecule in the universe that is out doing whatever it wants. God is sovereign over everything. And he is our father, and he is on the throne, and his diverse people are ultimately citizens of one kingdom, of one city. You see, the, the, the letter to the church in Ephesus is an interesting uh, um, lesson on theology and practice. Uh, Ephesians is five chapters. The first three chapters are theology. The last two chapters are practice. Uh, the first uh, three chapters of Ephesians are uh, doctrine. The last two chapters are duty. Based on what the first three chapters say, the last two chapters say what we ought to do in light of what he just showed us. Uh, look back with me, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. But now in Christ, Jesus... You who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. And might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing hostility. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens 
with the saints and members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. In whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple into the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Philippians chapter 3 verse 20 says it this way. It says, Christian, you are a citizen of heaven. In Hebrews chapter 11, it's speaking of Abraham, and it says that he was looking forward by faith to a city whose architect and builder is God. Our ultimate citizenship is not Lake County or any other city on this earth. If you are a Christian, then your citizenship is in heaven. It's the new Jerusalem. It's the kingdom of God. The Father's diverse people, diverse since creation, are ultimately members of one family, one household, one family. Christ has broken down the walls of all ethnic groups and all races, and when he broke it down, he brought them together into one family. And now, by his blood, we are blood brothers. And if you are unwilling to call those that are not the same race as you brothers and sisters, then don't bother calling me brother. Do not diminish what God has done on the cross. Christian, your brothers and sisters live all over the world. And they look very different than you do. Yet they're part of your family. In Galatians 2, uh, the Apostle Paul, just jot this down. It's worth going back and really reading later. Galatians 2, uh, Paul sitting down, and, or I'm sorry, Peter is sitting down, and he's eating uh, with the Gentiles. And, and some of the Judaizers, uh, they, they come into the city, um, and uh, uh, they're in Antioch. Uh, it's in Antioch where um, followers of the way are first called Christians. Uh, You read that uh, in the scripture. Um, But this church in Antioch, it was very diverse. Even in the first century, uh, the leadership was very diverse in in ethnicity. And uh, uh, these Judaizers, um, they they come into the city, and and Peter, he sees them, and and he's sitting down at a table with a a diverse group of people and uh, Gentiles. And when the Judaizers come in to this meal, Uh, Peter gets up from this table of diversity and and he goes to sit with the Judaizers because he's afraid of what they might think or what they might say. And then Paul comes on the scene hearing about this. Uh, You can read about this in Galatians 2. He goes to Peter and he says, "What, what are you doing? Your conduct is not in step with the gospel. Quit it. And so listen, racism is a gospel issue. It's a blood issue. Every Christian has gotten to know Jesus Christ as the Son of God in a personal way. We have a personal Savior. We're not born into this family. We're rescued into this family, saved through Christ by one Lord. Galatians 3.28 goes on to say later that there is uh, neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, no male or female, but instead we are all one in Christ Jesus. It's a bond of peace that we have, and Jesus is the unifier that all of our hearts long for. You guys are familiar with Genesis chapter 11, the the Tower of Babel. Um, In in that place, uh, people are united, um, but not united for God. They're united in pride. Uh, Jesus comes on the scene, and he does a much different work. Um, At the Tower of Babel, uh, God scattered them, and it says that he confused their languages, plural. But then later when Jesus comes on the scene in in the book of Acts chapter 2 after Peter has preached this message, he brings a diverse group of people together. One of the the, the very first messages from the gospel is, is bringing diversity together as one. And although Peter is speaking in a, in a language that they don't know, they understand it when they hear it. And so we are diverse from the very beginning of this thing. 
Jesus Christ has reconciled us to God. And reconciliation is, is much more beautiful than diversity. It's, it's not just, hey, we're all different. It's, hey, we're all one. And we're together in this. It's personal. We know God relationally, and so we want to know and love each other relationally. We are each members of a diverse body of Christ, and we are multicolored, we are multiracial, we are multi-ethnic, we are a multicultural bride of Christ. The bride of Jesus is multicolored, multi-ethnic, multiracial, multicultural, and she is beautiful. Ephesians 4.3 tells us that we have the power to maintain that unity of spirit in the bond of peace. The Holy Spirit that dwells inside each and every one of us, the moment we say yes to him, has given us the power to walk in unity and love, and we ought to be eager to maintain that unity, this unity that comes from the work inside of us. And we're not all raised that way. It's not what we've always heard. That's not what great-grandpa said. But because of the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of us, we have the ability to walk through uh, a life together because of the transforming work of the Holy Spirit. And so real quick, let's look at uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2. How do we walk in unity? With all humility. Which is the opposite of pride. Which is what racism is, is rooted in. With all humility and, and gentleness. He says there. Another word there would be uh, meekness. Now hear me, meekness is not weakness. Meekness is power under control. I, I, I'll be honest. I've had to work on that. Especially these last since, since May 25th, is, is anger and embarrassment that has raised up inside of me a white Christian. Not because of only what's happened, but because of how many have responded. Jesus says, you will know who his people are, how? By the love that they show others. How in the world, John says in, in 1 John, can you say that you love God yet hate your brother? He says you can't. We must be clothed in humility. We must learn to relate to each other with a spirit of gentleness. Relate to each other. Understand, try to understand. Listen with a spirit of gentleness. We must be very patient with each other because, yes, ethnic groups are different. And sometimes races are different. And sometimes cultures are different. And so we have to understand, we have to be okay with that. We have to accept that and allow the beauty of that to come into our lives. Why do we have to be patient? Because God's been patient with you. <laughs> I mean, that's a pretty good reason. None of us got what we deserved. I deserve eternal separation from Father. At my worst of my worst, on my worst day in 41 years, God's like, yep, I love you. <laughs> I'll give my son for that mess. Loves us and he's been patient with us. And so since he's been patient with us, we're required to be patient with each other. We must walk in forbearance. In other words, you're going to be provoked. Uh, you're going to be sinned against. There's going to be challenges. Um, Christians are going to fail. There's going to be uh, conflict. There's going to be tension at times, but we've been called to bear with one another in love. Um, we've got to be rooted in love, and that word love there, it, it, it's the agape type of love. That means it's supernatural. That, that says, um, God, help me to love beyond my own capacity. 
Help me to love in light of what the Holy Spirit has empowered me that dwells inside of me. Help me to bear the fruit of the Spirit. Because there is a way to know if the fruit of the Spirit or if the Spirit dwells inside of you. And and that's fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If that doesn't describe who you're becoming, we better take a couple steps back and say yes to him again. I need you, Jesus. Because right now there's no evidence that you're dwelling inside of me. Now we're, there's, there's going to be days, trust me. This message, I've never preached a message that wasn't more for me than those that are standing in front of me. This, this I, I'm a train wreck, y'all. The things that happen up here, if you knew what happened up here, you would probably wouldn't listen to a word I say. But thank you, God, that it's not like projected up onto a screen. But I know that I no longer live for myself. That uh, all of that self-centered living changed the day that I said yes to him, and it became Christ-centered. And, and, and he has, it works on us from the inside out. The moment you say yes, he comes to dwell inside of you. It's a, it's a mystery that has been hidden for all ages, Colossians says. Christ in you. And when he comes to dwell inside of us, he begins a work on us. And, and, and he's going to see it under completion, right? That's the promise. What he said at the cross, it is finished, it's done. The other promise is, is that he's going to see under completion the work that he's began in you. That means that we're going to go through tough times, trials and tribulations. But cheer up. He's overcome the world. And so we've got to be rooted in love. You can't be patient and gentle and humble and loving by trying really hard. You bear the fruit of the Spirit by walking with God and abiding in Christ. By depending on Father and walking step by step with the Spirit. You go back and you read Luke and what Jesus came to do. It says that he came filled with the Spirit. Jesus' walk in this world is a reflection of what's possible for us when the Spirit of God dwells inside of us. And so we're commanded to maintain this unity continually. And the goal of this unity is that the church will experience great joy. And from that great joy, we'll experience great growth. Because when a lost and dying and hurting world see us walking together as one in love, they can't help but wander. Why are you guys so happy? Why are you so united? Why do you walk like that together? Why do you love each other? And in those moments, we get to tell them Jesus. When Christ returns, Revelation 7, verse 17, says this, and I'm going to paraphrase the uh, John Abner translation here, if you'll bear with me. The tears that have been falling from multicolored eyes down multicolored cheeks God is going to take his finger and he's going to wipe away every tear from their eyes. And he's going to make all things new. And there will be no more racial strife. There will be no more cultural superiority because Jesus is victorious over it all. I would be remiss if I didn't take a moment to repent from my own thoughts, my own fears, my own pride. And so just as a a faith family, if we could just take a moment to reflect on the truth of the word, which is unifying, to look at our own lives, because it... It's cliche, but change ultimately comes from the the words of the maybe not so great theologian, Michael Jackson. When we look at the man in the mirror, 
And if we would just repent this morning, if we would just say, God, I don't want any thought, any word, any action that comes from my life to be displeasing to you. God, I just ask that in this moment that you would search each of our hearts. That you would find pure hearts. And for any impurity that is in us, wash it with the blood of Jesus. God, you have the ability to replace blind eyes You have the ability to replace hearts of stone with the hearts of flesh. I pray, God, that we would no longer be defined by what the generations that have come before us have told us. We would no longer be defined by the the pride that has manifested itself in our lives so often, hatred, fear, that instead we would be defined by who you say we are, heirs, sons and daughters, heads and not the tail, first and not the last. You have called us children. In the moment when when the disciples thought that you were leaving them, you were making a way to be with them forever. God, you were creating a place for all those that say yes to you to walk beautifully together in your design of unity and diversity. God, I pray that this community, this faith family, would represent that and that it would start with the individual. We would love, that we would walk together, that we would listen and learn from each other. And that through our laid down lives, our repented hearts, you would be glorified. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Let me say one more thing, and then we're going to close. If you would just allow me, with a a humble heart, to speak very briefly to the white Christian. Throughout history, anything that you've ever stood against... It wasn't enough for you to just not do it. You didn't want anybody to do it. So if it was abortion, you didn't just want your life and loved ones to not have an abortion. You didn't want anybody to have an abortion. And we stood out in front of Planned Parenthoods with red tape over our mouth praying that they would no longer exist. If it was homosexuality, it wasn't enough just for you to not be homosexual. You didn't want anybody to be homosexual. And so you created conversion therapy so that no one would be homosexual. If it was drinking, it wasn't enough just for you to not drink. We experienced prohibition in in dry counties because you didn't want anyone to drink. But in regards to racism, we've allowed us not being racist to be enough. And we've hidden behind the veil that I have a black friend. And it's no longer and has never been enough for you to not be racist. You have to be against all racism, period. Protests and riots are happening because of a public lynching 
that happened in Minneapolis where a white man stood with his knee on a black man for eight minutes and 46 seconds until he was gone. And yet we talk more about the riots than we do the murder. The riots are because of the murder. There's going to come a day when our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren learn about this moment in the history books. Hear me. The only way that we're going to come out on the right side of that history is if we stand against all racism, every form, in our homes, in our communities, and in our workplaces. It's no longer enough. It's never been enough for just you to not be racist. We have to stand against all racism. I love you. Thank you for allowing me to be here today.